Hello, screenwriters, and welcome to Writing for Screens, the screenwriting step-by-step -step project, episode 180. My name is Glenn Gers, and I come to you every Monday through Friday, if I can make it, at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time Zone, to let you watch over my shoulder, share my screen as I write a script. And I am doing this in order to teach a part of screenwriting that I think is undertaught, which is the day-to-day, line-to-line process of getting it done. How do you shape uh, an outline and a rough draft and a rewrite? Doesn't matter what kind of script it is, the process is what I'm trying to show you. The tricks of how you get all those ideas and feelings and characters and story ideas into pages, scenes on the page in script form that make sense and tell a story. How do you get that done? It's not the only way. It's not the best way. It's just the way that I taught myself, figured out in a 25-year career writing for movies and TV, and I thought somebody should let you see this stuff in case it's helpful when you are facing the blank page. You're going to do it your own way. Everybody is different. Every writer has different needs and different ways of working, and every project is different for every writer. So I'm not saying there's only one way to do it. I'm just saying these are some tricks you can use, some tools, some skills. That's it. Speaking of tricks and tools and skills, I really hope that you go to my channel. This is a little screen grab of the part that I'm trying to show you. The first three sections are screenwriting essentials, screenwriting tools, skills, and craft, and the process being a writer. Those videos, those are full of the real goodies. This is a lovely little demonstration. You can watch some of it. You don't have to watch all 180 hours of it, but those videos are really valuable. That's where I took everything I could figure out that I thought was a useful, practical thing to understand that you can use for your writing. I put them there. They're there. They're free. Please take a look at them. I think they will be helpful. Hi, Butte. Hi, Jenny. Good to see everybody. Uh, so that's it. That's what we are doing here. And so let's start doing it. I am going to open up my text document and get back into writing the scenes. Because if you work a little bit every day, just even fix a couple of, as you have seen, if you have watched some of the other episodes, sometimes what with questions and things to talk about, I only get two or three lines done. But you know what? Every day, if you keep doing two or three lines, page here and there, you get the whole script done. It is the miracle of accumulating writing. Hi, Jean. Uh, writing is a cumulative art. It is not an all or nothing. It is a bit by bit. Nobody gets it all at once. Nobody gets it all right at once. Okay, so this is where I stopped. Uh, now I need to look at it because I have not done so. Um, homes and workplaces. And the Zoom itself. Uh, All right, that's a little clearer. Um, hello, Natasha. How you doing? Peter, yes, yesterday was a very productive day for you or me. Um, yesterday was a very productive day in terms of me telling you guys stuff. Um, it was not the most productive day of, of getting writing written. But that's okay, because that's not the only reason I'm here. I am also here to talk. Um, All right, so we intercut between the crackers and homes of Zena in George, outside of George's house. Uh, okay, Zena paces George's front yard, furious. Uh, she has gathered 
the crime crackers in an emergency call. Boom. Uh, no, I'm going to put this front because this is what it's. Uh, okay, so. So, um, you know what? I don't think this needs its own line. We intercut freely, whoa, uh, between the crackers in their homes and workplaces, CNET George's, and the Zoom window itself. Okay, look at that. Um, all right. So Zena is mid can't just walk away. George got us close. This can work. I can't just walk away. Urgently, she exclamation pointed. Um, this, this just doesn't sound like Xena. What do you need? What do you need? I can come help. <laughs> I can, I could come convince. I can come uh, I just need to know if you're still in. Am I insane? I just need to know what you think. Am I insane? Are you still in? I just need to know if you're still in. I just need to know what you think. Am I insane? Should I do this? Um, Uh, boom, boom, boom. What can we do? This can't be her. How about Ted? Ted, the conspiracy. Thing. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? Eh, eh, just feels, feels like, uh, It doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, it's okay. <laughs> and sometimes you just let things be, be okay. Um, I mean, essentially this is just one thought of Xena's that I'm interrupting because I didn't want it to be just come in on a turning point lecture, uh, turning point speech. Hi, I write. Um, well, let me read this whole thing. But before I sometimes when you start to worry about one line without reading through the whole scene and getting a sense of what's important and what the point is of the whole scene. So, uh, I love that Shrimpton comes in. Like, this is important. This is just, it shows the group. The group dynamics are bigger. Than, like, everyone doesn't see it the same way. And it's a reality that there's, that, that Zena, in fact, is working, working her, her career ambitions. You catch this fella. Podcast's going to hit the big, your podcast's going to hit the big time. Because I risked my life. Okay, sure. You know what? If there's money and we're not dead, you can have some, okay? You all heard that. Now I feel dirty. <laughs> okay, this is fine, actually. I just need to clean up this. Um... What is Zena planning to do? This is this is an interesting question. Zena's, Zena's saying, I can't just walk away. Um, and then she says, I just need to know that you're supporting me, but supporting me to do, uh, to do what? Uh, yes, that's Nurse Shrimpton. And you're going to ask a great question, Jean, which is, last time we saw 
Nurse Shrimpton was trying not to be in the group. And now she is. Fair point. Uh, yes, that is. Uh, at the moment, we are going to call that our little secret. By the way, I'm assuming that that's what you meant. Yes. Nurse Shrimpton is back in the group. Um, <laughs> uh, somebody told me that they, they once worked with um, uh, Richard Price, the writer who did uh, Color of Money with Scorsese and Paul Newman. And supposedly they, they got stuck on a story point. Uh, there's just this logic problem in, and they, they you know worked for like a week or two, like trying everything. And then eventually Paul Newman just said, you know what? It's going to be our little secret. <laughs> they just like said, basically, we're not going to fix this. We're just going to let it go. It's not that big a deal. The people who are wondering about it, you know, they'll live. It's OK. Um, so I always think our little secret means sometimes, uh, you know, you leave up a, a plot problem, a logic problem, and that's just the way it is. <laughs> Thank you, Gene. Um, so at least for the moment, you know, if this ever went into production, I had to fix it, I would fix it. But uh, the, my main concern here is we just don't have a lot of time. Uh, yeah, in theory, I could uh, show a bunch of scenes of people getting the um, getting the, the text message like, hey, emergency meeting. And then we see Shrimpton deciding to pick it up. Uh, if I had if I wasn't trying to cut pages, I would put that in. Um, as for what's beat a beat is like a little pause yeah i i should uh, there there should be like a, a way to like send to uh emergence to, to a, a little um here this is the beat thing that he's talking about um i have i have yes here's the deal on beat the word beat has many meanings uh in the in the universe but especially in screenwriting and different people use it differently some people talk about the beat sheet, meaning what I would call the outline, which is all the beats of the story. So they, that's one sense of beat. But to me, that's just scenes. You know, an outline is a list of scenes, not beats. Uh, part of the reason that they call it a beat sheet is because in television, when they were outlining together, when the room got together, uh, all the writers on the staff, it's called The Room, they would sit with a whiteboard and they would write down the outline of each episode and they would do it literally beat by beat. In other words, they'd have a scene, but then they would talk about each step within the scene. They would call that the beats. Um, and that's a cool meaning of beat. In dialogue, I use beat to mean small pause, little change of topic, change of subject, uh, anything that, that's essentially a little break, uh, a little change. Um, they are taking a beat and then coming in on uh, some other uh, way of, of some other topic. Um, so in this case, the, the thing is she's saying, I'm, I'm in with one condition, in on the money too. She's having a little pause before she says it, like, get ready, listen to this, this is important. Uh, so that's what the beat is. Beat there is a little pause. Um, yeah, the reason that I don't do pause is because a pause is a serious silence, as far as I'm concerned. Pause, uh, yeah, the pause is like, you're noticing it. This is a little tiny switch uh, in, in, with it. Um, uh, you know, I have tons. <laughs> um, the, the main ones are, I mean, I did, if you, if you go back through these... Um, uh, these step-by-steps, uh, read the descriptions, you'll hit the point when I stopped writing the outline and started doing the rough draft. I talked a lot about what I was doing then. My main point about writing a first draft is, I believe, keep going forward. Do not slow down or go backwards um, in a rough draft. In a first draft, in a rough, rough draft, first draft, same thing. Um, what you are doing is trying to get something to exist. So therefore, if it is utter garbage, that's still worth pushing ahead and getting it there because you're just marking out the rough framework. You are getting everything you can in there. And if that's, you know, 100 pages, cool. My rough drafts are often only 70 pages um, because I just don't know yet exactly what I'm going to do with a lot of the scenes. But sometimes you'll get on a run and you'll find a page runs five scenes. A scene runs five pages. Um, so the answer, my personal 
approach to first draft or rough draft, whatever the real first one is, you're just sketching in. Put something in for every beat, for every scene. Even if it's literally a synopsis of, in this scene, they are going to argue about whether or not to break down the bank wall. Maybe that's all you get. And then you have like one person say, we should break down the wall. And the other one says, no, we shouldn't. And you leave it at that. Cool. That's a good start. So that is, those are my tips for uh, first draft. Uh, so back to this. Uh, I can't just walk away. George got us close. This can work. What is Zena planning to do? Yeah, but what can we do? Yeah. Cameron, let's do Cameron. But yeah, but it is her house. Yeah, but it is her house. Now, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but it is her house. It is her house now. I just need to know if you, if you're, if you're still, if you're all still in. You're all. Am I insane? I'll find a way. But am I interested? Find a way. If I can find a way. Am I insane? Should I do this? Suppose I can find a way. Am I? Suppose I. Hmm. I just need to know if you're all still in. Am I insane? Should I keep trying? Should I keep trying? Am I insane? Should I really try to do this? I just need to know if you're all still in. Am I insane? Should I try? Should I still try? Should I try to? I just need to know. Am I insane? Should I, should I try to do this? Well, those are actually two questions, two separate questions. But the answer to both is yes. <laughs> Hell yes. I'm in with one condition, in on the money too. What money? What money? You catch this fella, your podcast's gonna go big, gonna hit the big time. Book deal, HBO series. That all goes to you? All goes to you. Shrimpton is actually giving away the end of the <laughs> series, which is great. Uh, not that this happens, but that this is the truth of Xena. Because I risk my life. Sure. Well, because, because I risk my life. Okay, sure. You know what? If there's money and we're not dead, and I'm, we're not dead, you can have some, okay? You all heard that. Now I feel dirty. I guess you can afford your feelings, Carl, because he makes money at drug dealing. Now the question is, what do, how do I get access to now? Okay, now the question is, how do I, how far do I, how do I get access to? You know what I'm gonna do here? Boom. Okay, make that a really. You're doing this.
All right, what is this? Hmm. Okay, so now this I can get it. You should go. All right, Zena's already looking at Madeline, so I don't need that. See, this is more active than our standing in watch from. All right. Um, yeah, I don't think we need this. You should go now. You should go. You should leave. Well, I'm not going to leave now. You should go. Well, I'm not going to go now. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Um, I mean, honestly, the the phone ringing does not signify anything enormously significant. Um, to be continued. <laughs> like what she she wouldn't just say like, I'm not gonna go now like, oh, that's really important. It's just the phone ring. It could be anything. Um, you know, we can't just let this. Do. You know, we can't just Hmm. All right. So. You should go. Hmm. What I'm trying to decide is, um, in theory, they're standing in the doorway. The phone is in the house. In order to show her picking up, in theory, we're going to have to go inside like this to Madeline finding that um, phone, picking it up. What I'm thinking of is, we're outside. They're in the doorway. Phone is behind them, which means it's in the dark. It's it's out of sight. Um, if Madeline goes back in to answer it, we're going to need to go with her. Um, so what I'm trying to figure out is what what do we leave Zena on? I think that Zena is kind of determined not to not to let this end. So therefore, the question is: Does the does she say you should you should go? Does she say you should go? Does she say don't make me call the police? Really, you're doing this here. We can hear you. Hmm. Um, this is a very minor thing, but the flow of it, the idea that the phone interrupts a standoff, um, you don't want to make it just seem, I, I don't, this is an important turning point. 
that phone ringing is the beginning of the end, beginning of the escalation. Hello, Mike. Um, so I'm just looking at, we, we've been on a roll here about the, the conspirators plotting on how to, um, okay, now the question is, how do I get access to June? Really? You're doing this here? Does Madeline say, and Madeline already said she can go. Um, no, because it's, it's um, he's calling George's number. And if it, even if it was George's cell phone, she wouldn't have it with her. Um, also, no matter what, I need to get, because uh, Pedro's question is, would it help to have the phone out there? Um, and uh, the answer is eventually we got to get them inside, I think. So see, this is really the cool moment. The point of the scene was like, OK, <laughs> now what? Um, Maybe it's like Xena is kind of threatening. That's it. If this gets ugly, I win. Brief question from Mojo. Is it okay to give native speakers bad vocabulary for authenticity reasons and believability as long as it serves us well and doesn't confuse the audience? Absolutely. Yes. Simple yes answer to that. Yeah. Uh, you, you should allow your characters to speak um, uh, with bad vocabulary, bad grammar, bad anything. Uh, you, I often do. Um, there's nothing wrong with having people speak like people speak or even in other colorful ways that they don't really speak because it's kind of entertaining, uh, as in everything David Milch ever did. Uh, he did NYPD Blue. Um, and the answer is, yeah, just give them, give them the style that distinguishes how they believably or interestingly would talk. Um <laughs> Your ability to keep the state of flow going, to stay in the zone, regardless of how many sidetracking questions are thrown at you, is a masterclass on Jits. How is that done exactly? I will tell you, because that is actually kind of my my point. The thing I am trying to um, to to show you is the process of the flow, which is um, and the and the reason that I'm doing this, the whole reason that I decided to do this weird thing of, of writing and talking in public while I'm writing is because in the 30 or more 40 years that I spent trying to learn how to write, how to write at all, um, I had to do this. I had to like w kind of talk to myself. I often did it on the page. Um, and what I found was by becoming by asking the questions I'm asking and focusing on the things I'm focusing on, I can go easily into and out of the flow really 
smoothly. Now, that is because I have done it for 40 years. And I promise you, the first 20 or 30 of them was not like this. Um, the, the lesson there is practice, do it a lot, and follow a process, a ritual, a, uh, a mechanical uh, process, uh, which is, is somewhat, um, the more that you can stick to thinking in scenes, solving your problems with questions. There are certain things that I, all of my stuff, hold on, uh, as I have said, all this stuff in these videos, if you do this stuff for 30 years, you can do this. <laughs> um, and that is part of what I'm trying to show you is, is indeed that, um, and it really did start, I have to tell you, I, I've, told, I've told this story before, but um, for many, many years, I, I was an inspired um, and, and talented young wannabe artist. I was also a complete disaster at getting things done. Um, I could only get them done in this like white hot intensity, um, which I could not be sure would show up or last. Um, and when it didn't show up, you know, I would just, I would suffer. <laughs> I would, I would try and force it, which you cannot do. Um, so I had to learn, and I've talked about learning to really think about the scene, the moment, the dramatic action. Then there's, when you are writing almost anything, you are describing someone doing something. And by not focusing on yourself and not focusing on all the things about a script that you should do, but just focus on, okay, like right now, I have a bunch of people. I have Zena and Madeline uh, showdowning in front of the house. So really all I need to think about is what is Zena thinking and what is Madeline thinking and what does the script need in this one moment? Um, and as long as you're just focusing moment to moment, the flow comes pretty easily because it's really a small question. There's only a certain amount of things that can happen here. Um, so I'm just playing with, I'm try this one, try this one, try this one, no harm, no foul. And that's how you keep the flow, uh, especially because as I said, I had to teach myself this uh, while I was most of the time an office temp. Um, and when I was an office temp, I was literally sitting in someone else's office trying to sneak some writing in when, you know, in between Xeroxing and filing and answering the phones. All I could do was say, what is the one moment I am writing on this particular page in this particular scene? So, um, but I do want to point out, Pedros is completely right. It makes the characters more human. It makes them better when they do not speak perfectly. Nobody speaks, well, very few people speak in perfect grammatical English or whatever language you're writing it. Um, that's the whole point about dialogue is it's how people speak or, or how you want them to speak, not how a written document would read. Um, <laughs> thank you, Pedro. Um, it takes strength to express. Yes, I am exposing very little. I am just exposing the writing part, which, as I said, is the part I feel pretty confident about. Uh, okay. Let's see. I'm going to even make this capitals. There we go. That reads, you see? So, like, the thing is here, if you look at this, we've got this big run of talk. All these characters, Bunny and Xena, is, is riling up the troops, uh, focusing them, and then all of a sudden, really? You're doing this here? She turns showdown. In other words, Madeline threw her out. Xena hasn't left. Madeline is confronting her about this. Um, I really don't want this to get ugly. I like that. It's like Xena's kind of threatening. Um, now, um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just like, what I'm doing right now is spitballing things that Madeline could say. Um, you sure don't. Uh, that's another one. You sure don't. Or if it gets ugly, if it gets ugly, I win. Um, see, Madeline here is very confident. I'm just trying to think. You sure don't, because if I bet you don't, because if, I, if it gets ugly, I win. She's got some special ugly. In <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I bet you don't. Because if it gets ugly, OK, 
Okay, now Norman has got some. But we don't want that. <laughs> no, I don't want this to get too... I do like, I didn't expect, but I do like the idea that, that there's kind of a showdown happening with Madeline. Um, but uh, kind of like the idea that Norman's like, ah, you know, because he knows about the meth dealer. Um, oh, you're welcome. Cool. Uh, separate my British character's dialogue with Cockney or slang or imperfect dialogue. Absolutely. That's one of the fun things. Is if you can, if you know dialects, throw them in. Um, All right. Do you actually know those differences, Natasha? That's pretty cool. Um, I mean, that's that's uh, that's refined language, uh, not refined, but defined. Uh, but boom, so no, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because if it gets ugly, I win. It depends on what kind of ugly. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm just thinking mechanically here um, is that Mm -hmm. Well, depends on it. It's ugly. I won't tell. You know what? Actually, that's a none of us do. None of us do, so I'm sure we can. See, what I'm thinking is, in order to in order to get this, um, get to the, <laughs> it might be cool if actually. Um, Originally, I had this whole thing where it's like uh, he doesn't speak and he's kind of nervous and there's this like. Uh... But what I'm thinking now is it might be better if because of the showdown, Madeline says to Norman, you get the phone. So then he would bring it to the doorway and then everyone would see it. Yeah, that's that's actually the thing.
actually. So, uh, everyone is discussing British accents. <laughs> uh, all right, Welsh, Scottish, boyfriend is Welsh. Uh, are, you, are you from England? Do you have friends here? Uh, Scottish is really hard to understand. Yes, uh, that's. Uh, I, there are times when I have put subtitles on movies from Britain. <laughs> uh, Okay. <laughs> Natasha is from Memphis, but gets all sorts come for the barbecue. Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, meanwhile, back at the script, uh, here's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at a showdown, so there's this tension. So I'm putting a, a line in between every bit of... Um, I'm not thrilled with putting a line, a, a, a scene line, a, like an action line in between every line, but I also do want to explain what's going on in the unstated tension. I think this is... That's better. Um, why is that better, you ask? <laughs> um, oh, eyes off. Oh, that's not better because it's a comma. Yeah. Uh, because it's a, a simple, plain statement, and I like that. Uh, boom, boom, boom. That's a, the, the, the mood I'm trying to get is da 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 um, <laughs> Yes, indeed. Yeah, back inside. But, um, Um, it's, uh, the problem is, uh, yes, parentheticals can, but they don't, they don't step you out. Like what I'm, what I'm trying to do in this, like I could say, well, landline phone, it begins to ring, can't be a parenthetical. Um, this D. Here's the thing, trying to de-escalate. I personally hate when a parenthetical runs more than one line. Um, I could do this. 
but that it doesn't like I actually want to slow it down. So I think that's better. Um, yeah, sometimes you put those things in to slow it down. Not so much that it's not cool. Um, first of all, I per and I know friends. I have friends who will write three line parentheticals. Uh, I hate a parenthetical that runs more than a line. Um, Eleventh pet, you know, this is, Natasha is making me look so bad. <laughs> she is getting eleven drafts passes on a script while I do one. She, I am admittedly spending less time per day. Yeah. Actually, now here's the thing. I, do we need to go back inside? I don't think so. Although. What I'm thinking now is, do we need to see Norman pick it up? Shouldn't, couldn't he just bring the phone to her and say, guy wants to talk to you? Okay. Yeah. So then the question is, What and Ma what would Madeline and Zena be saying? Uh... <laughs> I'm kidding. I you do not make me look bad. You make me look good because my inspiration is clearly having a heck of a uh, of an effect on you. Although, yeah, you are a workaholic, but you know what? You got to be if you want to work in the arts. You got to be an or a workaholic. Um, we don't like to call it workaholic. We like to call it someone who enjoys what they do. All right. So, what is Madeline's? Now, you know, Madeline is, um, what is Madeline going to say to Zena in the, in the break here? Okay, now the question is, what is Madeline? I mean, Madeline took a big stand back here. Madeline, Madeline already took a big stand. So, what is it that she's saying now? Us, uh, it's going to be to everybody. Not 
just to Zena, but to everyone on her Zoom listening. I don't know why, but I know that whatever she's got to say, it's got to be to everyone, not just to Zena, because she's already shown Zena the door. She's like, get out of here. Um, and then whatever's going to happen, Norman's going to interrupt. She So what is it? Madeline now has to make kind of a speech. Um, the thing is, she already did that. Let's see. No, she didn't make that much of a speech. This is her moment to to stay. Look, look. Uh, okay. So, what is the speech here? Point is, <laughs> uh, see. By the way, uh, uh, I think Alex is it. Alex who was asking about rough draft. Let me go back. Yes, Alex Alexis, here's the deal. <laughs> this is an example of rough draft because I'm creating something that that is, this is the first draft of this speech. I don't know what the speech is. So the first thing I'm going to do is say, I know a speech here, uh, mad taking her stand. Point is, <laughs> because I don't know yet. So now when I come back to this, I'm going to be like, okay, now I have to work through what is this but but this is my first draft <laughs> my first draft is as bad as that um it is it is simply a placeholder of this is what has to happen here i don't know how it's going to happen yet but i know she's going to be taking a stand with the zoom okay she's not listening Hmm, this is an interesting question. Um, all right, so now I know, like when I put this away for today, at least I've marked out, like I know what's going to happen here, which is, this showdown has to erupt into Madeline taking a stand, and then that stand is going to have to be undercut by the, the um, by the serial killer. So about serial killers, since one is about to talk to her. <laughs> um, about how you shouldn't mess with serial killers. Yeah. Let me just make sure she didn't already say that. All right, and the point is, um, Mad intends to bring secret to police. Yeah. Okay, that is what is going to be this speech. Big noble.
Now, here's the thing. Why? If I make it too clear that Madeline intends to go to the police, why would talking to the serial killer make her not go to the police? Except, of course, the serial killer is going to say, please don't. That doesn't seem quite strong enough. That's going to be the interesting question. Hmm. All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to I'm going to take a pause here because there were two questions asked. <sighs> okay, so Megumi asked. How many characters would be too many in one story of different parties chasing a comic, common object in a video game? Uh, no, no, it's okay. This, it's all right to ask when it come. The answer is <laughs> as many as you can get away with, <laughs> depending on your skill level. Um, there's actually a famous movie, which is widely considered a bomb, but I kind of like it, a flop, a, a disaster, called It's a Mad, 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 Mad World which was, is a comedy about a whole bunch of people who, for various reasons, are all chasing the same buried treasure uh, um, in Los Angeles in the 1960s. And it's a, it is over the top, uh, widely hated. I kind of like it. Um, but anyway, the, and I, I wrote a, a movie, uh, an independent film with uh, 18 major characters and over 100 speaking parts. Um, so the answer is, as many as you are technically capable of getting away with is certainly not too many for any actual um, standard Hollywood um, industry uh, their fears and rules would be you, you don't want to have more than five or six on an ensemble, um, you know, like you five or six main characters. Um, but realistically, I think it would be cool to say, Hey, I got, I got a, a story and sort of the, the selling point the cool thing about it is that it's got 30 main characters. <laughs> now, the thing is you need to be technically capable of maintaining a story at that level of complexity it can be done. Game of Thrones managed it. Of course, that was not, a, that was, a, that was a show, not a movie. Um, but Game of Thrones easily had 30 major characters. Um, and they did what I consider is a really good job until the end um, with, with juggling all of that. Um, there is also a budgetary issue. The reason that I made my little uh, indie film with that many characters is because I wasn't paying anybody. It was all deferred payments. Um, and even that became a problem because I couldn't afford to release it because the deferred payments would kick in and there was no money to pay anybody. So the answer is, um, there is budgetary questions, but depending on the type of production you're doing, any number of characters is cool, depending on whether you can write enough story scenes to that make sense and juggling the different storylines to have. Um, ordinarily, an ensemble story will have six, eight, maybe, Eh, four to six main characters, major character stars. Um, there will be a dozen more. Um, you get something like, you know, uh, the Avengers. Um, that Well, you see, Avengers probably has six or seven main characters. Um, by the time you get to Endgame, because you're pulling in people who have been main characters in other stories, so they're, they're not really main characters in Endgame, but they get their moment in Endgame, and it feels like there's... 40 main characters, but they also paid that off over 22 other movies. Um, so anyway, the answer is, from a standard American business point of view, the answer would be two or three main characters for a standard story. An ensemble has six to eight. Uh, more than that, you are pushing it, but you can do it if you can do it. If you can, if you can show people, a, you're going to have to write that. You can't promise it. You'll have to say, uh, I am. I, you actually have to solve the problem: how to give each person their amount of story time when all that's happening. But I think it's doable. I personally like ensembles. Um, 
Any tips on how to convey a long time in the past more than a six months later? And a few big gaps. In our, um, you know, it depends. Sometimes it's sort of cool to just have, you know, black screen six months later. Um, uh, depending on what it is, there can sometimes be some kind of detail. Like, you know, there's a broken window uh, in an old house, and then you do a dissolve, and it's now full of snow drifts because winter has come. Um, you can certainly do visual things like that. Um, it's not a bad idea to have some kind of distinctive thing, like, you know, they're at the beach and then they're uh, around the fireplace. You know, uh, if it's going to be years later, uh, sometimes having somebody come in and they're they're five years older and, and you describe their differences or they say something which defines their moment. I don't know. Uh, the answer is, I don't think it's so bad to have six months later. But if you don't want to do it, uh, try and think of distinctive actions or um, or or um, visuals that will uh, say it will trigger to the audience. Hey, something has changed. Um, yes, that's exactly right. The placeholder idea, the idea of writing something in the place, is that it keeps you from stopping. Um, can you have a, have a coastal town without mentioning fish people? You might. You could. I'm sure that you can. I was just trying to make it as cliched as possible so as to quickly uh, suggest. Um, oh, hi, Chez. Uh, yeah, yep. Yeah, just tuning in. Well, alas, uh, you are going to be tuning in on me saying so long till tomorrow. Um, but I am very glad that you were here. I'm very glad all of you were here. We did get some, we got some, we got some place here. Um, discovered a whole thing. Uh, Megumi has a pro another problem, which I'm not going to get to talk about, but let's see what it is. When I write something, I look at the next day and say it's bad. Uh, the, the answer, the short answer to that is uh, don't stop. Like, yes, maybe the next day you'll say it's bad. Maybe six months later you won't. So keep writing. Don't go back. That my answer would be no matter what, don't go back until you have completed the entire draft. That would be my advice for this. If you if you have a tendency to self attack, the first thing you want to do is get something out of you onto the page, because if it is bad, there will be something good in there, um, and and you can make it that the, this good or bad thing, eh. It's all relative. It's all sliding scale. It's it's better or worse, not good or bad. And so therefore, what you want to do is get it begun, get the draft done. Also, you never know. Maybe what you wrote is bad, but the thing you're going to write in three days will be good, and then you'll have a good thing to pull towards. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, the answer is um, one of the main things is keep moving forward at least until you get a full complete draft, which can take a long time. Um, I would also suggest you look at my videos, small steps, um, because that's really a lot of it. How do you keep going? Um, and the one create a ritual, because honestly, the answer is if you, if you are always saying, if you always say anything, then it's not about the thing. It's about you. OK, if you always say your work is bad, well, your work couldn't always be bad. I mean, just like statistically, some people will be better than the others. So if you're always feeling it's bad, that's your feelings, not the work. So ignore it. Fix that in therapy. But but don't attack your work. If you always say something, don't trust it to be an accurate <laughs> reflection of your work because your work is going to be different every time. All right. Uh, you are very welcome. Happy to talk more tomorrow. But at the moment, I'm going to say goodbye. Go write something.